Rich, thank you very much for joining us. Group, let me introduce you to my wonderful colleague, Neeraj Sood, a very well-known health economist with the Schaefer Center, vice dean of faculty at the Price School. Uh, I shared with you an editorial that he wrote for the Wall Street Journal about two weeks ago on the importance of testing. There was then a follow-up editorial that he's in the bottom of, but not on the byline because the Wall Street Journal doesn't allow you to have two op-eds in the journal in two weeks, but basically Neeraj did anyway. And it's on the importance of testing coronavirus as a way to mitigate its impacts on the broader economy. And Neeraj, let me turn it over to you. And thank you again for being here. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, testing for COVID um, and try to explain um, why it's needed, what the different types of tests are, and what the value of uh, testing would be. Oh, it, I'm, so, and I'm sorry, Neeraj, I, it, just one other piece of housekeeping that occurs to me. If you have a question for Neeraj, feel free to do what uh, Shlomi did and just send me a question in chat, and I will pass it on to Neeraj as soon as there's an appropriate gap in his presentation. So sorry about that, Neeraj. Please continue. Yeah. And, and yeah, my goal is to maybe just talk for 10, 15 minutes and then take a lot of questions. Uh, so let's just kind of start with, so let's forget about COVID for right now. I know it's difficult to forget about it. And let's just think about testing for a disease that we know and we understand and what the role of testing is. So if you ask a clinician, why do you test someone for a disease? Their answer would be, hey, I want to figure out whether the person has disease X or disease Y. And once I know what disease they have, I can actually treat them with that disease. So that's one goal of testing, which is to figure out what the diagnosis is and then provide an appropriate treatment for the disease. Um, now let's say it's a well-known or well-understood infectious disease. What would be the role of testing? So there the role of testing would be, I want to, I, I want to again identify people who have the disease or who have a virus or a bacteria and who could be potentially infectious and who could infect others in society. So now I wanna test people who you know, are symptomatic, who might have a fever or other symptoms, figure out if they actually have this infectious disease. If they have the infectious disease, isolate them so that they cannot spread the disease to others in the population. And then what we wanna do is figure out who this person interacted with in the last few days. And that is what uh, public health folks call contact tracing. So you wanna figure out who these person's contacts are, test those individuals, figure out who was infected there, and try to halt the spread of, a, of an infectious disease that way. So that's the second goal of testing. So the first goal is let's treat people, figure out the diagnosis. The second goal was let's uh, do this contact tracing and let, let's try to spread the, the, this, uh, the, reduce the spread of an infectious disease. So now I'm going to talk about two other goals of testing, which clinicians or public health folks typically underappreciate. So for a new disease, I also want to test to figure out how many people in the population actually have the disease. And once I know that, that can help me understand how contagious this, this disease is or what the true mortality rate from the disease would be. So in some sense, the third idea of testing is to understand a disease. So it's not diagnosis, it's not trying to spread, uh, reduce the spread of the disease, it's just trying to understand what is this disease about? How deadly is it? How contagious is it? And so on. And now the last purpose of testing could be, suppose there was a test where if I, te if I do the test, I can tell people who are actually immune from the disease and who cannot spread the disease to others. So that would be a fourth purpose of a test where instead of identifying people who are sick, I'm identifying people on the other end of the spectrum, the people who are not sick and who are immune from the disease and cannot spread the disease to others. So now let's think about testing for COVID and let's try to understand the value of testing for COVID. 
happen. So the first thing I said is, you want to test for COVID because you want to diagnose people and provide them the right treatment. But the problem with COVID is there is no treatment. So letting someone know that they have COVID doesn't change clinically what I do with them. If you have lung fibrosis or if you cannot breathe, it doesn't matter whether you have COVID or not. The treatment is, the, is still the same. I want to relieve the pressure on your lungs. I want to be able to help you breathe better. So, that, so for COVID, since we do not have an effective treatment yet, just testing sick people so that we can diagnose them doesn't really benefit us because it doesn't change how we treat them. The treatment remains the same and we're basically treating symptoms rather than the disease or the virus. We don't have a drug that can actually kill the virus right now. So just testing sick people who have fever and so on for COVID is of little clinical value. Now let's take kind of the, the second goal of testing, which was, look, COVID is an infectious disease. So if I can test someone who has COVID and then figure out who they had contact with, and I can test all of those individuals, I can reduce the spread of COVID. This is exactly what South Korea did, and they were very successful in doing this. And this is one of the reasons why most experts think that the, the COVID outbreak in South Korea was controlled. But the challenge now in the US is, you can only do this at the initial stages of infection. So if I have, 100 people who are potentially infected with COVID, I can test those 100 people and then I can test the 100 people they were in contact with. Now that's 10,000 people I'm testing just for initial 100 people who had COVID. Now imagine if there are 2 million people in the population that have COVID. Contact tracing for 2 million people, we don't have the capacity to do that. That would mean, you know, potentially testing 100 million households. If each one of these million people were in contact with 100 other people, maybe there is some overlap in their contact groups, but now we're testing in the millions and millions. And so the, the traditional wisdom is, look, we can do contact tracing early on, but once we've spilled the beans and, and the cat is out of the bag, contact tracing is no longer as valuable because it's just impossible to do. So for COVID in the U.S., the first patient was diagnosed in, uh, in January 5th, on January 14th, uh, a person who, who, who came from, who was visiting Wuhan and came back to the U.S. Probably uh, we had COVID infection much earlier than that because COVID started in China somewhere in December. And there's a lot of flights coming from uh, China to the U.S. So we probably had our first case much earlier. And now we also know that COVID is highly infectious. So the number of cases double every three or four, four days. So if you start with just one case in January and you say you double the cases every three or four days, you end up with millions of cases right now. So right now doing contact tracing is going to be of little value because we probably already have millions of people with COVID. So the second purpose of testing contact tracing is, is not going to be a high value proposition right now. It would have been a very high value proposition in January when we first started detecting COVID cases. That was the time to intervene with contact tracing. So now let's take the third goal of, COVID, of, of testing, which is to figure out what this disease is about. So one way to figure out what this disease is about is to test a random sample of the population. So think about it this way. If I want to do a poll and figure out who's going to win the next election, I don't want to just poll Democrats or I don't want to just poll Republicans or I don't want to poll people on the extreme right or the extreme left. That's not going to tell me who's going to win the election. What's going to tell me who's going to win the election is if I take a rep representative sample of the U.S., and then ask them who's going to win the election. That's the same idea for COVID. If I want to learn about, the COVID, about COVID, I don't want to just test the sick people or the symptomatic people. I don't want to test just the elderly. I don't want to test just kids. I want a representative sample of the U.S. population. 
I want to test them, figure out how many of them have COVID, how many of them will die in the future from the infection and so on. So that's basically what I proposed in the Wall Street Journal editorial, that we need to be doing this random sampling, testing a representative sample of the U.S. population to learn about this disease. And so, so why, why would that be important? So for example, right now what we're doing is we've tested the very sick people and we've said we have 10,000 confirmed cases. Then among these very sick people, a high fraction of them die. And then we look at that mortality rate and we say, oh my God, this is a really dangerous disease and we got to do something about it. But we don't know that for every confirmed case, how many unconfirmed cases of COVID with mild symptoms are present in the US. So the CDC does a similar thing for the flu. And what they estimate is for every person who's reported with the flu to the CDC, there are 80 other people who are running around who had the flu but had mild symptoms, never got tested and never got reported to the CDC. So if you want to calculate the true mortality rate from uh, the flu, you need to multiply the denominator by 80. You need to know not only just the confirmed cases, you need to know everyone who's, who in the population is infected. And then the numerator is the number of deaths from flu. And so when you multiply the denominator by 80, what you get is that the flu mortality is 0.01%. But for COVID, what we're doing is we haven't multiplied the denominator by 80 because we don't know how big that denominator is. We don't know for every person with COVID the, how many people are there who are asymptomatic, who've never been tested for COVID. And that could be orders of magnitude higher than the confirmed cases. So knowing that will put the current deaths in perspective. Are these current deaths coming from 10,000 cases or are these current deaths coming from 10 million cases? If they're coming from 10 million cases, this is a highly contagious disease, but not a very deadly disease. If these are coming really from 10,000 cases, this is a very deadly disease, but not contagious. So understanding how many people have it is of critical uh, importance. And then finally, just last week, there was a new test approved under uh, emergency use authorization uh, by the FDA. What this new test does is it, it tests for COVID antibodies. So what are antibodies? Antibodies are cells in your immune system that fight viruses and bacteria and so on. So if you, have, if you test positive, that means you have COVID antibodies, which means either you had COVID, you had the virus in your body and you recovered from it, or you currently have an active infection. So if you wait for a week and you, so if you have symptoms right now and you wait for a week and you develop symptoms, that means you are in, under active infection. But if you are antibody positive and you have no symptoms and no symptoms develop in the next one week, that means you are recovered from COVID. And so what is the advantage of identifying people who are recovered from COVID? First thing, since they are recovered from COVID, they don't have the virus in their body and they're no longer infectious. So these people cannot infect others. Second, since they already have antibodies in their system, they can fight COVID. They are most likely to be immune from COVID. So if someone is COVID recovered, you wanna put a red T-shirt on them and say, you can go to a movie theater, you can go to a restaurant, you can go to a hospital and actually take care of a sick person with COVID. You can take care of your grandfather. You don't need to worry about social distancing. You can re-enter the workforce because you're immune from COVID. So what I'm trying to do in Los Angeles right now, uh, working with the LA County Public Health Department, is to do antibody testing on a representative sample of people uh, in LA County. And the idea would be we would do the test today, or we're hoping to do it in a couple of weeks. And then we would repeat the test every two weeks. So every two weeks, we will get new information about how many people in Los Angeles County had COVID antibodies, how many people are potentially immune from COVID in, in, in Los Angeles County, 
what is the spread of COVID look like? Is the prevalence of COVID rising over time? And this information is going to be critical for LA County to figure out what to do. Should we continue with stay at home orders? Should we do uh, just social distancing? Should we increase the strength of the quarantine? What should we do? That depends really on how many people have these antibodies in the system. So I'll probably stop there and, and, and take questions. So Neeraj, let me just ask you a, a, a clarifying question because um, our audience doesn't have a lot of statisticians in it, I think it's safe to say. So when, when you hear about political polling, you hear about margins of error. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about a sample of a thousand people, tell us about what kind of margins of error you will have from that sample. So uh, for a sample of thousand people, you will have a margin of error of plus minus three percentage points. So if I, if my test says, uh, say 20% of people in Los Angeles have COVID, I, this is just hypothetical. I don't know uh, the result. Uh, the margin of error would be from 17 to 23%. So if the point estimate is 20%, the range would be 17 to 23%. So I, I have a question from Elizabeth Kim saying, aren't they saying there are a few different strands? Does immunity with one suffice when a person can get coronavirus more than once? So coronavirus is a new disease. And so we don't know for sure uh, whether antibodies give you immunity and the duration of the immunity. But most experts think that it does confer some immunity and maybe a lot of immunity and the duration of the immunity would be at least a few months. But can I say that for sure? I cannot because this is just is such a new disease. It's, it's, you know, our understanding of it is, is not at the level of uh, several other diseases, but I'll kind of give you an example. There was a study, a very small study of just five patients published in JAMA, which is like the leading uh, medical journal where what they did is they had five patients who had COVID and who were on ventilators, had the most severe form of the disease. They took antibodies from the blood of people who had recovered from COVID and then they injected these antibodies into these five patients. And these five patients saw a remarkable improvement in their clinical status, which, so which kind of shows the power of the antibodies. That even among patients who had a raging infection, injecting antibodies from recovered patients led to big improvements in their clinical function. So to me, that suggests that having antibodies in your blood would very likely confer immunity. But can I guarantee you that? I cannot. So we have a quick question from um, Kristen Lust-Smith, who is asking about the Iceland experiment, where mm -hmm. they did do a lot of random sampling and a fairly large share of their very small population. Could you tell us what, if anything, we've learned from that experiment? Sure. So uh, Iceland is, is working with a company called Decode, where their goal is to test everyone in Iceland uh, for COVID. Uh, and what they found was, so they did, they did the, the, the reports I have seen, which were about a month after they did, uh, after an outbreak in Iceland. So they think the first patient in Iceland happened sometime in February. And they did testing a month after that. And about 1% of the population in that random sample had COVID. And if you look at the confirmed cases, so the, the projected number of people with COVID were 100 times the confirmed cases in Iceland, which basically says like the multiplier from confirmed cases to unconfirmed cases is about 100 fold. Okay, I can't help but ask the question, is Iceland representative of anywhere else in the world? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. <laughs> and that's uh, why, you know, we need to do the study in, in, in Los Angeles and in New York and in Seattle and so on. And we cannot rely on data from Iceland or Wuhan and so on. Um, so from uh, similar questions from Sonia Civilian and Misty. Uh, from Sonia, how will the testing sample be determined? Um, from Misty, how are you finding people to test? Uh, so the way we are finding people to test right now in Los Angeles County is 
we have an online panel. So we've, we've hired a market research firm. So what do market research firms do? They try to get a representative sample of people in a certain population, and then they test out products with them. So they test out, you know, what does a new car design look like, or what does a new soap feel like, and so on. So we've basically hired a market research firm to get a representative sample of people in Los Angeles County. And instead of, you know, testing out soap or cars or computers, they are scheduling appointments for people to come to uh, testing sites that we're going to set up uh, and, and get tested. And could you repeat Sonia's question? And question was, how are you going to pull your sample? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's kind of the, the goal. Um, again, a, a similar but somewhat different question from Shlomi Ronan. Um, what, uh, what is the rate of testing currently in Los Angeles County? Uh, I, I don't know the exact number. So what Los Angeles County is, is testing right now is, is what is called PCR testing, which is uh, testing for the virus in your nasal swabs or throat swabs rather than for antibodies. So what they're testing for is an active infection, not for uh, antibodies. I don't know the number of tests LA County is doing. I did have a, a discussion with uh, the Keck School or the Keck Health System, and their capacity was to do about 40 tests a day, which is really abysmal. But that's what their, their uh, capacity was. Uh, I've heard a lot of talk about expanding testing capacity, but I think there is a big shortage of, of reagents that are used in these tests. And uh, so it's not just the testing kits, it's other products that go with the test that are in short supply. You know, it's, it's, I had a summer job in college working for a company called Clinical Assays, where mm -hmm. we were, it was, uh, I was doing QCing of coded test tubes with reagents. Mm -hmm. I never thought that that job all these years later would turn out to have been so important that we <laughs> actually produce so many things that are done uh, reliably. Uh, uh, what about this? And I'm, I'm going to jump the queue a little bit here. So Abbott Lab announced a um, do-it-yourself or a, or a quick five to ten minute test the other day, and they said they were going to start using it on Wednesday. Presumably that, again, is more like a swab test. It's not the antibody. Yes. Do you know anything about that? And, so and the, a changer? So, so that, that is uh, a PCR test. So, again, that's going to test for uh, active infections. So let me explain. So uh, testing for active infections is good for if you want to provide treatment, but we don't have treatment. So the big thing about testing active infections is, look, I can isolate these people, but if people are already isolating, the value of that diminishes. But if people are not, you're saying, hey, I know for sure you have the COVID virus, lock yourself in a room. And the other advantage of a PCR test or testing for active infections is I can do contact tracing. I can say, who were you in touch in, in, in contact with? Let me go test them. But the PCR test doesn't tell me how many people in the population ever had COVID. And if I don't know that, I truly cannot understand this disease. So it's kind of like it's giving me a snapshot. It's telling me today how many people have COVID. What I really want to know is how many people ever had COVID in the last two months. And for that, you need an antibody test. So a PCR test is good for diagnosis, good for contact tracing, isolation, not really good for understanding the disease. Um, a two-part question from Michael Tesler, and I'm actually going to do his questions, though, in reverse order, because uh, I think it'll flow better that way. First question is, do you believe that China is honestly reporting their numbers? <laughs> or do you not want to get to that? <laughs> I, I really don't know. I really don't know. You okay. know, there's a good, you know, I'll leave it at that. I'm not an expert on that. My guess is anybody, as good as anybody else's. I haven't seen, like, a smoking gun or something like that, but I, I don't know. Yeah, well, it, it occurs to me the WHO is watching them a lot more carefully than mm -hmm. they used to, and presumably that is mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. an issue, but our friend Matt Kahn, I think so it was, actually, just, yeah. just a comment on that. Like, yeah. what I would love to do is 
antibody testing in Wuhan or Hubei province right now? Because there are kind of these two competing narratives. So one narrative is China's quarantine, extreme quarantine measures work. And as a result of that, the disease or COVID didn't spread in the population and the epidemic was controlled. So that's narrative one. Narrative two is, no, the disease spread everywhere in the population. And after 60% of the people get the disease, you develop herd immunity and the epidemic dies. So if I do antibody testing in Wuhan or Hubei and 60% prevalence on, of antibodies, then the second narrative is right. Then these extreme quarantine measures didn't work. But if I test in Wuhan right now and only 5% test positive, then their extreme quarantine measures worked. But that says when they relax it, we might get wave two. We might get the, you know, so I think, like, I don't know why they're not doing it in China, but that's like the first thing I would do there. So I, I guess, so uh, Musa has a question that sort of relates to that. And I think you kind of answered it, which is that you don't know the answer, um, which yeah. is what is the benefit of social distancing and how long does it need to last to be effective? But based on what you just said, we really don't know. Is that? No, exactly. Correct? And that's why we're trying to do these surveys every two weeks so that, if even with our social distancing, if I see the prevalence rise rapidly every two weeks, then it says social distancing is not working. The disease is already spreading at a pretty fast rate. But if the prevalence is stable over time, then I can say, look, it seems to be working. I know this disease is contagious, but somehow every time I test, I only get 10% positive. So it must be that we've stalled it at 10%. percent i am going to go back to Michael. And, and this is a question, again, I don't know. I'm, I'm certainly wouldn't be comfortable answering it, but I'll, I'll try it on you. And again, if you don't want to answer it, feel free <laughs> to say no. But of the countries that have had success in containing COVID, who has implemented the type of phased reentry to the economy that you are su suggesting? So has there been people who are sort of identifying people and letting them out to participate? So I know I've seen news reports that Germany is planning to do it. So they, uh, they are planning a big program where they do antibody testing. And if you're recovered, uh, then, you know, you're allowed to re-enter the economy. I think I'm forgetting which one either. I think it's Sweden uh, that has had less. So their approach has been uh, to try to isolate uh, the high risk elderly population, but let the lower risk younger population go to restaurants, bars, go to work, go to school, and so on. And their idea is that, you know, as the younger population gets infected, they are going to be recovered, and they're going to be a protective shield for the elderly population. So their idea is you're kind of getting herd immunity by first infecting the least or the lowest risk population, which is the younger population. And that has a payoff for the high risk population. And are we seeing the evolution of the disease in Sweden differ from other countries? I think it's uh, similar, but I, I don't know the details of the data yet. That was sort of what Boris Johnson was proposing, wasn't it? Exactly. So Boris Johnson was proposing that. And then there is this modeling group in Imperial College London, which said that, uh, you know, COVID is going to kill uh, 500,000 people in the UK. And then the UK government got scared and implemented kind of mass quarantine. And now that same group has lowered the mortality estimate tenfold from 500,000 to roughly 50,000. Uh, so clearly, like, we really do. And that's the point that we, you know, to figure out how many people are going to die from COVID, we really need to know what the true mortality rate is. We really yeah. need to know how many people are there who have it and who had mild symptoms, and no one knows that. And so everyone's making assumptions. So if you make a worst case assumption, you get 500,000 deaths. If you make another assumption, you get 50,000 deaths. So what do you, so as you know, I mean, so the, the reason I asked Neeraj here, there were a number of reasons, but one is we were just taking a walk together. Uh, actually, I think Neeraj, it was the last day we were permitted to go to work, or if I recall, yeah. is that right? So it was two weeks ago, Friday. Yes. And I was saying to him, I, I, um, 
I was very calm about all of this until Italy came along. And mm -hmm. when you look at fatalities in Italy, they are high relative mm -hmm. to the population in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, now that said, it's also the case that the average person who's died in Italy of the disease is I think 78 years old, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are stories about, well, not stories, it's true. It's an old country demographically. Uh -huh. you know, it's in a place with really bad air quality, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, can we infer anything from Italy? So, but Italy was, as you mentioned, the thing that started freaking me out about this whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, can you comment on that at all? So, so Italy is definitely scary. And you'd look at the situation in, in Italy and you, you, know, you would be worried. But I think there are several reasons why uh, what's happening in Italy is, is not representative of what would likely happen in the U.S. Uh, so the first is, uh, you know, the disease that we kind of think is closest to COVID is probably the flu. So if you look at, because, you know, both are respiratory diseases caused by a virus. Uh, so if you look at flu-related mortality in Italy, it is about six times higher than flu-related mortality in the U.S. So in the U.S., flu-related mortality is assumed to be around 0.1%. In Italy, it's about 0.6%. So there was something about the Italian population that just made them more vulnerable to respiratory diseases even prior to COVID. They were dying at six times the rate of the U.S. population. And, and, and what could that be? Uh, so the reasons I've heard is first, as you said, the demographics are very different. Uh, Italy has a much more uh, older, like their median age is about nine to 10 years older than uh, the U.S. population. Their smoking rates are higher. And uh, I think they like to hug more. So there, it's probably like it's the disease spreads more in, <laughs> in, in the Italian uh, population than in the U.S. population. And their, you know, their healthcare uh, system is, is different. And I've heard that, that there are pockets. So there are villages where the, the, the fraction of the population that's above 65 is even higher. So there are pockets of elderly. So now if a, if a contagious disease spreads there, it's going to overwhelm the system. So it's not just how many elderly you have, but how they are geospatially distributed. If they are in pockets, then you're going to get these stress points where a lot of people are dying in a short amount of time and they're overwhelming the system. Uh, so I think, I think that's what I have to say about Italy. But so Italy is, is very scary. Another question from Michael. Is it really interesting one? Has there been polling regarding the likelihood of Americans to participate in contact tracing? Now, I suppose, as you said, Contact tracing really, the, the horse is well down the road and it's just not yeah. easy anymore. But uh, it, it is, it's a good point in the sense what I heard from South Korea is they had contact tracing on, on like steroids. So this wasn't like, so the South Korean government knows where you live, knows all your credit card history, has all your medical records. So they developed a phone app where once you tested positive, it would be broadcast on a map that there is a COVID positive person who visited the store because you swiped your card there, who, you know, so, and so their contact tracing looked very, like, I don't think we could have ever implemented something like that, given the system we have in the U.S. And I don't know, you know, how much appetite people in the U.S. would have to say, if a, you know, a government personnel comes in and says, okay, now I know you have COVID, tell me all the people you met in the last hundred days and, you know, interrogates them and then goes to them and so on. So I don't know how much appetite or infrastructure we have to do this in the U.S. And as I said, I think right now they're already, it's already so spread out that it's probably, it's a fool's errand trying to uh, do contact tracing right now. All right. This is probably, I'm going to ask, somebody wants the following question answered. And mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, th again, you do not have to answer it. Uh -huh. But what would be your most optimistic view of when the economy will be opened again? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm hoping in, uh, in a few weeks, maybe six weeks would be the optimistic view. Okay, six weeks. So that's May 15th, more or less. 
Yeah. Yeah, we're going to hold you to that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's why I want to do this testing. If I did the testing, I could, I could give a, a, more, a better answer. But, of course. Uh, of course. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Neeraj, thank you very much for spending some time because I know you've had a crazy day today. So uh, thanks for dropping by and spending some time with us this afternoon. Richard, uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you to the audience for listening.